Hello learners and uh, listeners. Welcome to Indragani National Open University. Well, my name is Chamo Yantan, Faculty of Library and Information Science from School of Social Sciences. And well, in continuation of the previous uh, lecture, today we shall be discussing on the topic different tribes in Nagaland. Uh, well, many people, when they talk about Nagaland, they look at it as a very homogeneous kind of uh, uh, society. But Nagaland itself is very, very diverse. In the state of Nagaland, there are about 16 tribes. And today, we will be discussing the tribes of uh, the tribes in Nagaland. Well, before we go further, let us uh, give a reflection on the last, the previous uh, discussion which we have had. In the previous discussion, we talk about Nagaland as a vibrant state located in the extreme part of uh, Northeast India. And the term Naga also implies the Naga tribes inhabiting in different parts of Northeast and Myanmar. So when we talk about Nagas, it is not only the Nagas who are uh, residing in the state of Nagaland, but also it includes the Nagas residing in different parts of the Northeastern states and also the Myanmar. And Nagas belong to the Indo-Mongolian family and they speak a variety of Tibeto Burma languages. And Nagas are well known for their rich, colorful traditions, bravery, honesty, and love for music. And the state of Nagaland is inhabited by 16 tribes. And all the villages of the Naga tribes are politically and economically independent of each other. And history tells us that the right, right from time immemorial, the Nagas, irrespective of tribes, were living independently in their own villages. And they identify themselves with their village and holds great pride to belong to a particular uh, village. This is just a reflection of the previous lectures and today we will be discussing the tribes of Nagaland. This is a part two and since there are 16 tribes in Nagaland, uh, we may not be able to discuss in detail of all the tribes. So what we will do is maybe some tribes we will uh, try to go a little detail and the remaining will just try to give a very brief introduction about their tribes. Well, uh, let's uh, also, before that, I also would like to say about Nagaland and Article 371A. Historically, the Nagas have always been proud of their independence and, you know, a Bristol lifestyle. And under Article 371A, in the Constitution, special constitutional safeguards are provided to protect Naga identity and way, Naga way of life. And the Indian parliament cannot make any law in respect to religious and social practices of the Nagas. The Naga customary law and you know, procedures administration of civil and criminal justice involving decision according to the Naga customary law, ownership and transfer of land and its resources. When a Naga person, you know, uh, come out of his village, he identify himself with his a village and not with his clan. And when the same Naga moved farther, he identified himself with, uh, with his tribe. In the previous lecture, I have also discussed about the, how important is a Naga village and how the people hold dear, you know, uh, of their, their reputation, of their village, uh, you know, name. So when they go out, they always try to tell about uh, not about a clan, but also they mostly tell about that I belong to this particular village. And of course, this shows the diversity of tribes among the Nagas. And the Naga tribes was, you know, the highest uh, social, I mean, the tribe, you know, of the Naga, you know, highest social identity of the village in the olden days before the a collective Naga identity came into being. And the tribal identity had a common language, common culture, and a belief in a distant common descendants uh, as its basis. 
And the Naga, the whole Naga society was divided into various tribes and each tribe was independent of the other. And there was no centralized political structure. Each Naga tribe, you know, being governed by its own chief or elders under various customs and tradition. As I've also mentioned that every Naga village was a small republic. It's like totally independent from any other, no indifference from any other particular village. It's because they're all like run or administer their own villages without any indifferences from the, any particular uh, tribe or any other outside uh, villages. And there are 30 plus Naga tribes, 16 in Nagaland, 10 in Manipur and other tribes in Manipur, I mean, Burma, Assam and Arunachal and Pradesh. And in the state of Nagaland, there are 16 tribes, which I have just mentioned. Angami tribe, Ao tribe, Chang tribe, Chakasang, Kemingan, Konyak, Lotha, Pom, Puchuri, Rengma, Sangtsam, Sema, or Sumi, or Yumchungar, Ziliang, Kuki, and Kachari. Each tribe is distinct and unique in character from other, others in terms of customs, uh, language, and uh, and attire. So there are 16 tribes in Nagaland and out of these 16 tribes uh, the 14 tribes falls under the definition of the Naga and the two tribes that is Kuki and the Kachari uh, even though they are a tribe in Nagaland but they don't fall under the definition of a Naga. Well let's start with Angami tribe. Angami is one of the major uh, tribes of Nagaland and Angami Naga, you know, story, the origin centers in the Kazami village of Kazu Kenoma. And the main traditional economic activity is agriculture with rice as its main uh, grow. In fact, uh, you know, Nagaland, the entire Nagaland state, you know, their main activity is agriculture. So Angamis are also, you know, one of them you know, main activity. In fact, their activity is, main activity is agriculture. And Angami tribe is known for their ecological consciousness use of their, you know, their water courses for terrace, uh, wet rice cultivation. You can see the picture. Basically, it was, uh, it looks now, you know, it's a berry field now, terrace cultivation, it is called. Uh, it was mountain, and this mountain is, you know, how they will, how they, you, you can see it now. They have already, you know, made into a, a better field. The, first of all, they look for, a, you know, a, a, a water source, where there is enough source for them to cultivate this. And in this kind of cultivation, uh, it doesn't shift. It is a permanent cultivation, unlike the other tribes, which practices a jum cultivation, the Angami tribe, they, uh, you know, they, they have this uh, terrace cultivation, which is cultivated, you know, year after year without shifting to any particular uh, place. And unlike other Naga tribe, of course, Angamis are like, uh, are very much into terrace cultivation. And traditionally, property is divided equally among sons, uh, with others also receiving a share. And among the Angamis, the youngest male is in the family, inherits the parental home. Kituki means uh, is the youngest one, which takes care of the, the whole, you know, the responsibility of their parents during their old age. It is the youngest, like many other tribes, uh, it is the youngest who inherits uh, the parental home. And it is also the responsibility of the youngest one to look after the parents uh, during their old age. Let's go a little faster. And animism was the traditional religion of the Angami, but of course uh, this needs to be further uh, explained. But maybe in the latter part, since we will be having another lectures on the Naga religion and uh, other uh, aspects, we will not discuss here. And entry into the house is through a heavy wooden door and often curved with Mithun heads, human heads, because the Nagas were headhunters, and other conventional design. You can see the house, 
It's very well curved. You know, you can see animal's head. You can also, you know, see a different kind of designs that is uh, clearly, meant, uh, clearly, you know, like a uh, curve there. So when you go to an Angami house, you, you often come across uh, this type of uh, design in the villages. And the fundamental uh, principle of Angami social organization is uh, patrilineal and patriarchal structure with descent and inheritance, you know, passing along the male line and authority exercised by the male. And adoption is usually resorted to when a couple does not have a child, particularly a, a male child, to ensure the continuity, continuation of the, you know, uh, Petrol lineage, you know, which of course also differ from other tribes to other tribes, I mean tribes to tribes. And certain tribes of Nagas, uh, you know, adoption is, uh, you know, it's not an easy process. And usually when they adopt, they usually adopt uh, a female child, not a male child. But Angami, you can see that when, you know, couple does not have a child, particularly, you know, they don't have an, a male child, they have an adoption, which uh, is very different from the other tribes. And the man exercises authority over his wife and children. And of course, as I have also mentioned, all no Naga uh, are without an LN. And tra the traditional institutions of the Angami tribes were very, very democratic. They are also well known for their democratic in their, you know, uh, in the institution, in the, you know, uh, the societal uh, setup. And in some cases, when there was no male here, the daughters used to act as a caretaker of the family property and reverted, reverted to the male line uh, subsequently. And if the parents were childless, the property used to go back to the father's own lineage. Yeah, and you can see a beautiful Angami traditional dress with a spear, with a tau, which is shown on the uh, left side of the, the PowerPoint. You can, through their pictures, you can, uh, you can visualize or you can imagine the colorful tradition the Angami uh, society uh, is having. And these are the Angami shawls. The Nagas are well known for their colorful, beautiful design shawls, and these are some of the beautiful design worn by the, the Angami uh, men and women. And now coming back to our tribe. Our tribe uh, is another one of the major tribes in Nagaland. And the our tribe inhabits the district of Mokokchung. They believe that their ancestors emerged from Long Trok which means six stones. And the stones are located in uh, Chungli Yimdi, the first Ao tribe village, which is now you know, presently located in another tribe's area, that is Sangtum area. And you can see in the middle, that, that is uh, where they, you know, they believe their origin, the six stones, that is the Long Tro. And you can also visualize uh, by the costumes, ornaments uh, worn by uh, the old lady and the young lady on the left and right side. And ours are called our uh, by other tribes, which means those who went away. This is basically during the migration, uh, during the migration time. And this is a direct reference to the migration of the people from the first uh, village established by the Ao called Chungli Imti. And the Aos have two uh, distinct dialects, that is the Chungli, Chungli and Mungsen. The Ao considered, you know, Chungli Imti to be the seat of their civilization. And it is from here that its history can be traced, but, uh, but beyond Chungli Imti, they do not have much clarity. And tradition claims that it was here that the village organization that is prevalent to this day was initiated and formulated. And the Aos Naga lived in a well-defined and highly equalitarian society. In our language, the concept of society is enshrined in the word uh, Lukti Lipa, meaning way of life of the people. And feast of marriage 
reflected the splendor and the celebration of Naga life. We will be discussing in detail about the Feast of Merit, which uh, will be in the letter, but I will be discussing uh, much in a much uh, elaborate way. In our, you know, Naga's social life, the Feast of Merit, you know, played an important role. It was the belief that, you know, the provider of the feast attained honor in this world as well as uh, in the world to come. So the Feast of Merit is a very important, uh, important aspect in the Naga society. A person who could uh, provide a Feast of Merit was highly respected and honored, and he was entitled to wear beautifully designed ornaments and colorful shawls and you know, could erect uh, ornamental posts and decoration in front of their house. And you can see the pictures uh, over here. Uh, the, on the right side, you can see uh, the Ao folk tents where boys and young boys and girls are coming together and uh, dancing. And on the left side, you can see a male who must be uh, a leader, you know, and who must have already provided uh, a feast of merit because you cannot wear all those kind of ornaments, all these kind of costumes without uh, having recognition in society. And well, not everyone could afford to offer the feast as it involved a great deal of expenses and demanded certain ethical restriction for social you know, acceptance. And they involve a strict cultural pattern which were expensive and involved several ethical disciplines. It involved collecting firewood, preparing of food, killing animals and distributing meat to all the families. And the feast was for the whole village which lasted for certain days and months. Seems like when you are throwing a feast of uh, merit in the, in the our tradition, you know, you are supposed to give a feast to the entire village, you know, which is actually, which requires a lot of heavy expenses and a lot of labor and time. So, which was not possible by ordinary people. That is the reason why when a person gives a feast of merit in the Naga society, they have a lot of uh, reputation, a lot of respect and reputation in the Naga society. And Feast of Merit provided the most significant social status in the Naga society. It is a feast performed by rich people to share their wealth with a whole community and in, in return, the, you know, the earn status in society and you know, temporal uh, salvation. And it is, if performed successfully, it is believed that it would uh, bring prosperity because it appeased the gods of the sun, the moon, and the stars, and return would bring forth shower of, uh, showers of blessings. That is what the Ao, you know, believe. Of course, not only the Aos also, but the other Naga tribes also have a very strong belief on this Feast of Merit. merit. And the motive of giving the feast uh, seems to earn coveted status in society. And this privilege, I mean, this privilege uh, was extended to their children and grandchildren up to three or four generation. And now coming back to another major tribe of the Nagas, that is the Lotha tribe. Lotha tribe, they call themselves as Kyong, is one of the major tribes in Nagaland. The word Lotha derived the Kusa, and the Angamese uh, language, uh, Latha means gone to far place. That is like they have gone ahead. Yeah, and the Ao called them Zanir, which means power to swim, which means maybe during the migration time, they must have come across, they must have come together during the migration, and uh, they must have, you know, uh, come across a river in, during the migration and maybe the, uh, the Lotas must have swam the river and that's why the Ao call them Tsanir, which means the power to swim. And Woka is the home and headquarter of the Lota Naga tribe. And like most uh, Naga tribes, Lota uh, traces their origin in Kezu Kenoma. 
Kezukenema is a very significant, uh, you know, uh, location for the many Nagas. They all trace their origin to this Kezukenema. And Lotas are divided, uh, you know, into 20, about 20 clans. And they are well known for their success in warfare, adventure, hardworking, and unity. You can see their colorful dress worn, ornaments and dresses worn by the Naga, the Lotanaga ladies and uh, men. And from the very beginning, the Lota system of governments, government was a republic type. What was important and unique was the participation of every individual in the deliberations of any public issue. And there was direct democracy and the true and a pure democracy in reality and in practice. In Lota society, the strongest in the battle and the greatest performer of Feast of Merit could become the head of the administration. And the Lota Naga society is generally egalitarian and democratic in nature. It is patriarchal society where lineage is traced through the male members. The village is one of the outstanding social political institutions of the Lotas. And the villages are defensively located on the top of the hill to protect themselves from any outside aggression. As you know about the Nagas, who they are headhunters, so most of their villages are located in the hilltop. And there was no class distinction in Lota you know, society. Perhaps the most conspicuous object in the Lota Naga village is the, uh, the head tree. It's called Mungidong, that is, which you have seen the tree. Whenever the Lota migrate to any particular place, they always carry uh, you know, a small plant of this particular tree. And they will put it, they will plant this particular tree in the village. And they believe that if this particular tree uh, grows more, there will be prosperity and blessing in the village. And if tr this tree does not grow, that means the village will not have much prosperity. And the place of the Mengidong can never be changed. And it is something like an omen because if the tree grows well, it would mean increase of the population of the village. Um, but if the tree withers, it means the, the, the rivers. And the Lothar practice a peculiar type of democracy with little variation in the nature of its composition. They were uh, nominally you know, uh, cover, governed by the chief, chieftains of their respective villages, chosen for their bravery in war, skillful democracy, diplomacy, richness in the form of cattle and land, or power of oratory in contrast to the, to the hereditary uh, system. And for the Lotas, the chief men, you know, chief, the chieftainships was not hereditary. And to, beca to become a chief, a person has to fulfill certain qualifications, like he must be from a family who originally founded the village. He must have virtue of capability in the war. He must have skillful diplomacy. He must be physically fit and strong. He must have very good moral value. And he must possess wealth, and he must have powers of oratory. Uh, skills. So these are some of the qualities that is required to be a chief in the Lota village, which is which was not hereditary but democratic in nature. And feast giving was an important part of the Lota Naga. The feast of merit are a hallmark of uh, social distinction for, in fact, most of the Naga villages. And as the Nagas are very conscious of their status, a rich Lota Naga is very never satisfied with a large holding of a bumper crops or a rich world of cattle unless his distinct social stand is recognized. That's the reason why Feast of Merit provided the most significant social status in the Naga society. And it is the feast performed by rich uh, people to share their world with the whole community and in return earn status in society and temporal you know, salvation. And well, so uh, this comes to the end of the second part of our lecture and the reflection is that we have from this uh, lecture we have understood the diverse tribes in Nagaland and in this lecture we discuss about the Angami Naga tribe, the Ao Naga tribe and lastly we discuss about the Lota Naga tribe. In the next lecture we will continue to uh, discuss about the remaining Naga tribes. So with this, we come to the end of uh, the lecture. Thank you very much.